A Level Paper 2, June 2019. This equation is about amines. Remember, amines have N's in them. So an NH2 is a primary amine because the N is bonded to one carbon. An NH is a secondary amine where the N is bonded to two carbons. And there's just an N bonded to three carbons with no H's. Um, it's a tertiary amine. Give an equation for the preparation of 1,6-diaminohexane by the reaction of 1,6-dibromohexane with an excess of ammonia. Well, first of all, you've got to know what 1,6-dibromohexane um, is. So it's six carbons with H's and a Br, one at carbon number one and one at carbon number six. So there's a Br at either end of a six-carbon chain. It reacts with two ammonias, so we need excess, plenty of ammonia. That's the condition for a reaction of ammonia. And the NH3 replaces the Br's. Uh, by nucleophilic substitution. The Br comes off as Br minus. The NH3 breaks an H off and it forms two uh, moles of HBr. HBr incidentally reacts with two more ammonias and makes ammonium bromide NH4Br. If you take everything from the left and everything from the right, the two HBrs cancel and you end up with this equation here. Uh, Br, CH26Br, so 1,6-dibromohexane with 4 moles then of NH3 because 2 extra moles of NH3 have reacted to make the ammonium bromide. NH2 is at either end where the NH3s have replaced the BRs and NH has broken off um, to make NH2 amine groups at number 1 and number 6. 1,6-diaminohexane that is and 2 moles of ammonium bromide NH4Br. Complete the mechanism for the reaction of ammonia with 6-bromohexyl amine, so this must be this chemical here, um, to form 1,6-diaminohexane. So there's an NH2 at one end and this NH3 is going to replace this Br. There's a carbon at each of these points here, so there's a carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So there's a carbon there at that point. And that NH3 is going to use its lone pair of electrons. Remember, arrows can only ever travel from lone pairs or uh, double bonds, single bonds or rings. So it's got to come from a lone pair of electrons on the NH3. And it's going to bond to, react to the carbon uh, and the Br is going to break off. So it does this. So the NH3 bonds to the carbon and then the Br comes off. And it's actually going to make this NH3 with a plus on the end. So the NH3 has replaced the Br on that carbon there. So the carbon's still there. And the NH3 has replaced the Br where the Br was. There's a plus on the end. And the H breaks off um, to leave NH2. And the plus then is, it disappears because electrons have been moved onto the plus. And it makes H plus NH2. NH2 at either end, and there's your mechanism. Suggest a structure of a cyclic secondary amine that can be formed as a byproduct of this reaction. Well, what actually happens is instead of the NH3, the NH2 at this end here, which has a lone pair of electrons, bonds to the C instead. So instead of an NH3 bonding and having nucleophilic substitution with, uh, with on this carbon here and the Br breaking off, the actual NH2 on the other end actually bonds. Have a look how many carbons there are. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that sixth carbon there, the N bonds to. So it's going to make this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbons. And that N on this end has bonded to this C here. So it's bonded to a C and there's still six C's in there. NH2 um, here has a plus on the N because the N has given away electrons, become a plus. And H breaks off, removes the N plus and leaves NH and that's your cyclic compound. 1,6-diaminohexane can also be formed by a two-stage synthesis starting from 1,4-dibromobutane. -dibro so dibromobutane uh, Br, Br, 1 at 1 and 1 at 4, carbon number 1, 2, 3, 4, 
and because if you notice butane becomes hexane it gets two extra carbons so CNs are used cyanide ions can lengthen the chain from bute to hex and I'm going to need two of them to replace the two BRs and therefore it forms this compound here one carbon two three four five six it's going to form nitriles and so it, it will um, I'm going to need cyanide ions I use cyanide potassium cyanide makes cyanide ions and I use methanol and water water and methanol uh, to create these cyanide ions so the potassium cyanide dissolves in water and methanol the potassium part is a spectator ion it's the CN minus and the lone pair of electrons that um, are involved in the mechanism now then I want to turn this into 1,6 diaminohexane so I've got to turn these N's into NH2's to add H2's the easiest way to do that is hydrogen and nickel so the reagent is hydrogen and nickel is a catalyst that's the condition explain why 3 amino pentane is a stronger base than ammonia well when um, uh, something with an N in it an amine reacts as a base it reacts with an H plus bases accept H pluses and it uses the lone pair of electrons to bond to the H plus and what actually happens in in 3 uh, amino pentane which is this chemical here the the N has a lone pair which is available it's more available than in ammonia because of something called a positive inductive effect that's where these cut this carbon chain pushes repels electrons away from itself just like a methyl group this chain will repel electrons away from it and increase the availability of the lone pair of electrons so that this uh, N H2 group this amine group can then act as a base and accept H pluses justify the statement that there are no chiral carbons in three amino pentane there's three amino pentane there's no carbon with four different groups bonded to it and therefore there's no chiral centers there's no chiral carbon or no asymmetric carbon atom Question 2.1. Complete the diagram of the apparatus used to distill the cyclohexene from the reaction mixture at 83 degrees C. So I've got a mi reaction mixture. It contains a mixture of cyclohexene, um, presumed with some water or something like that. I've got some anti-bump granules to stop big bubbles forming and I'm heating it up. I'm expecting the two different um, the cyclohexene and the water will boil at different temperatures and as they boil they'll come down this tube here I want to measure the temperature as they come down this tube here I'll need a condenser with some water in and water out to cool the gases back down into a liquid and I want a thermometer here with its bulb um, level with the with the outlet tube and I'll need a bung to stop the gases escaping so I'm going to need a thermometer with a bung bulb level with the side arm condenser jacket a sort of condenser with water going through it uh, water goes in the bottom and out of the top so it's going to look like that make sure your bung touches the side so that there's a neat fit make sure the bulb of the thermometer is at the bottom and then make sure you've got a condenser that looks like this with uh, an open tube going right down the middle and then uh, another tube going around the outside which is going to have water in and water out so it looks like that for all of the marks all of the two marks the distillate was shaken with saturated sodium chloride solution the cyclohexene was separated from the aqueous solution using a separating funnel explain how a separating funnel works so a separating funnel looks like this you have two different layers that don't mix maybe like oil and water or something like that those two layers that don't mix are called immiscible and what you do is you turn the tap and you run the bottom layer off and when the top layer gets down to the bottom then you close the tap so it's just a physical process where two liquids are immiscible don't mix and you run the bottom layer off by opening the tap and you close the tap before the top layer runs through and you can collect the lower layer um, then in a beaker or something like that in a container the cyclohexane separated was obtained as a cloudy liquid the student dried this cyclohexane by adding a few lumps of anhydrous calcium chloride that's 
good compound calcium chloride to remove water. Um, it's cloudy presumably because it's got um, the cyclohexene has still got a little bit of water in there, little water droplets in there that will make it cloudy. Give one observation that student made to confirm the cyclohexene was dry, in other words the water had removed, presumably it's going to lose its cloudy uh, water droplets, it's going to go clear or no longer cloudy. In this preparation, the student added an excess of concentrated phosphoric acid to the cyclohexanol and it made cyclohexene. Concentrated phosphoric acid is very similar to concentrated sulfuric acid. It will remove water and uh, remove an OH and an H on an adjacent carbon to remove water and leave a double bond, hence the cyclohexene. Um, Calculate the percentage yield of cyclohexene obtained give your answer to the appropriate number of significant figures. So let's have a look here. So cyclohexanol, I've been given a mass and an MR. The only reason I've been given a mass and an MR is to work out number of moles. So moles is mass divided by MR, 14.4 divided by 100, 0.144 moles of cyclohexanol. Now the cyclohexanol makes cyclohexene. You can see from cyclo, um, it's going to be six carbons in cyclohexanol and six carbons in cyclohexene. So one mole of cyclohexanol is going to make one mole of cyclohexene. So it should make the same number of moles of cyclohexene from the cyclohexanol, 0.114. Um, what else do I know then? I know the MR of uh, cyclohexene. Um, it's been given me that as 82. I know the uh, number of moles of cyclohexene. So moles is mass divided by MR. So mass is moles multiplied by MR. And I multiply the number of moles of cyclohexene, 0.144 by 82, which is the MR. I should make 11.81 uh, grams of cyclohexene. The mass of cyclohexene actually formed then, what, how can I work that out? Well, I've got uh, a density. Why would it be given density? Density is mass over volume. So maybe I can work out if I've got the volume. Uh, I've got the volume 4.15 centimetre cubed. Look at density. It's in grams per centimetre cubed. So it'll give you density is mass divided by volume. The volume needs to be in centimetre cubed, and it already is. So density 0 0.180 equals the mass divided by the volume 4.15. So the mass is 0 0.810 uh, multiplied by 4.15. I should make, uh, so I actually did make 3.36 grams and I should have made 11.81 grams. So my percentage yield is smaller divided by larger. 3.36 divided by 11.81 multiplied by 100%, 28.45. Now it says the correct number of significant figures. Uh, I've got three significant figures, three significant figures, three significant figures. It needs to be three significant figures. So I'm going to round it up to 28.5% is to three significant figures. Cyclohexene reacts with bromine. Complete the mechanism for this reaction. Well, um, uh, electrons will come from a double bond, just like when they when they when you get um, electrophilic addition with HBr, then the electrons go from the double bond towards the Br, and then the Br is going to join onto one of the two carbons. So. Uh, double bond goes onto here and the Br joins onto one of the two carbons. It doesn't really matter which one, but it'll join onto one and the other one hasn't got enough bonds, hasn't got enough electrons, is plus charged. And then the Br minus, which has come here, look, the Br minus, the bond has broken, the electrons have gone onto the Br. So there's the pair of electrons from the bond gone onto the Br. It's had electrons uh, moved onto it, so it's got a minus charge. And those electrons, remember, an arrow can come from um, a double bond, a single bond, a pair of electrons, or a ring. Um, and it will attack then that uh, plus charge there and join on. And that's your mechanism, electrophilic addition of BRBR, similar to HBR or sulfuric acid. Question three. The outer layers of some golf balls are made from a polymer called polyisoprene. The isoprene monomer is non-cyclic. In other words, it's a chain, so it's not joined in some kind of circular shape. It's, it is branched. And it's a hydrocarbon, so it contains hydrogen and carbon only. So we know it only contains those two elements. It contains 88.2% carbon by mass. So by subtraction, we can work out the, the percentage of hydrogen in there. So let's have a look how we go through this. So percentage of mass carbon is 88.2. Hydrogen must be 100. Uh, take away 88.2, which is 11.8. 
you divide to work out the the, the ratio the, the number of uh, the ratio of the number of atoms in the molecular or the empirical formula you divide by the mass number of each of them the mass number of carbon is 12 so you divide by 12 the mass number of hydrogen is 1 divide by 1 so there's 7.35 to 11.8 i've got to get these into whole numbers so I divide by the smaller of the two, so I divide by 7.35, and I divide this one by 7.35, so you find the small number of the two. You divide both of these numbers by the smaller number, and then it comes out as a ratio that's closer than to whole numbers. 1 to 1.61. Now I've got to multiply by a number to get whole numbers. Uh, so if I multiply this by 5, it gets very, very close to 8. So I multiply both by 5, 5 to 8. So the empirical formula, which is the molecular formula, it says the empirical formula and the molecular formula are the same. So C5H8. Now how do I then deduce the structure? Well I know it's branched. I know it's got five carbons and um, it can't have single bonds otherwise CnH2n plus 2 would be C5H12. If it had one double bond it would be um, C5H10, CnH2n. Um, so it's going to have two double bonds because I've got fewer hydrogens than uh than than 10 so one sing one double bond would be c5h10 cnh2n for an alkene so i've got an extra double bond in there which will lower the number of hydrogen atoms still so i've got to have um five carbons two double bonds it's a branch chain so we'll try four one two three four um you can do it it says um, do a structure so you could do the displayed formula instead or you could do the structural formula as I've done here one two three four with a branch and I've put two double bonds in um, so the double bonds are at carbon number one and carbon number three with a methyl group as well and that's the only structure that you can have you could try others but you'll find that's the only structure that works out with a branch chain five carbons and two double bonds there's no other way to draw it the insides of some golf balls are made from a mixture of three other polymers the repeating unit for one of these polymers is shown below so this is how it is as a polymer with these chains going outside going along so this will form the sort of backbone the middle part of the of the polymer with uh, carbon bonds going outside and then each of these units will then repeat and repeat and repeat and we've got this group here uh, with two carbons and a double bond uh, as a branch off the chain so um, draw the skeletal form of the monomer so before these bonds these single bonds have uh, bonded either side left and right to make the polymer it's been this monomer here with a double bond so you take the two single bonds that are going left and right to form the bo the, the the sort of chain the middle chain the uh, skeleton of the the backbone of the uh, polymer and you make these this here into a double bond so this double bond is broken and a bond has gone left and right to make the long polymer chain so that's all you have to do uh, the skeletal formula of this then you remove all the h's and you put the c's as dots and it or, or corners um, and it looks like this then so i've got a double bond and then i've got a single bond and i've got a double bond double single double um, and all the hydrogens are then not shown uh, upac name of this it's uh, a diene two enes two double bonds it's bute diene um, and they're at carbons number one and carbon number three so it's bute a uh, one three diene um, that's its upac name that's its real name the second polymer in the mixture has a repeating unit structure shown below a third polymer is a stereoisomer so a stereoisomer um, has the same um, structural formula but different arrangement of atoms in space and you can see here if we go to the left of the double bond um, then um, if we go to the left of the double bond and I trace it so if you use Carningal prelog then the top group the CH2 takes priority 
in both cases because the carbon bonded to the left hand carbon has got an atomic number of six whereas the hydrogen below has only got an atomic number of one and the same on the right hand side so that is z that's the z isomer so now what i've got to draw is the e isomer where they are opposite each other give a reason why this type of stereoisomerism arises it's because there's no free rotation around the double bond um, golf balls are recovered from lakes and ponds um, again after being uh, in water several years explain why these golf balls do not biodegrade because you'd have to break the very strong carbon to carbon bonds so carbon to bo carbon bonds are very strong Question 4. Substances P and Q react in a solution at constant temperature. The initial rate of the reaction was studied in three experiments by measuring the change in concentration of P over the first five seconds of the reaction. The data's in Table 1. So let's have a look at P. Uh, zero seconds, then five seconds later, the concentration is changed. And in Experiment 2, five seconds later, the concentration is changed. Five seconds later, the concentration is changed. The concentration is coming down because P is reacting. Uh, show, uh, show the initial rate of P for each experiment. So what you do is uh, rate um, is the change in concentration divided by time. So work out the change in concentration, 1 times 10 to the minus 2, take away 0.92 times 10 to the minus 2, which is 0.08 um, times 10 to the minus 2, and then divide by 5, and it comes out as 1.6. I do the same for experiment 2, take these two, two, two numbers away, 0 0.16 times 10 to the minus 2, divided by the time, 5 seconds, and it'll come out as 3.2 times 10 to the minus 4, and then the same here, 0 0.5, take away 0 0.34 um, times 10 to the minus 2, is 0 0.16 times 10 to the minus 2, divided by 5, is again 3.2 times 10 to the minus 4. Now what I've got to do is I've got to determine the order with respect to P and the order with respect to Q. So what I do is I'm going to ignore the five seconds now. I'm just going for the, for the initial rate at zero. So I'm going to ignore the five second rows and I'm going to look between experiment one and two and see if either P or Q hasn't changed. Yes, Q hasn't changed. 1.25 times 10 to the minus two is the initial concentration. Uh, for experiment one and it's the same for experiment two so i'm going to take an extract of those two um, this is the concentrations of p between experiments one and two and this is the concentration of q between experiments one and two and i've taken the rates for experiments one and two here experiment one 1 1.6 times 10 to the minus 4 experiment two 3.2 times 10 to the minus 4 so i've got these here and what i then do is i take this one and divide by this one and raise it to the power x. x is the order with respect to this chemical, which is p. Then I do this one divided by this one, and raise it to the power y. y is the order with respect to q, and I divide the two rates. I don't raise those to any powers at all. Then this is 0 0.5 to the power x, where x, again, is the order with respect to p. These two cancel. That's why I've chosen two numbers that are the same. So that cancels, so this whole section cancels out. So 0 0.5 to the x equals, these two come out as 0 0.5. x, the order with respect to p, can only ever be 0, 1, or 2. If it's a 0, something to the power 0 is 1, so it's not a 0. If something is to the power 1, it's itself, which it is, so x is 1. If it's different, then uh, it must be a 2. And x can only be ever be a 0, 1, or a 2. So x is 1. Now I've taken experiments 2 and 3, and I've taken P, the initial concentrations of P in experiment 2 and 3, the initial concentrations of Q in experiments 2 and 3, and I've taken the two rates between experiments 2 and 3, which happen to be the same. I'm going to do the same thing again here. 2 divided by 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus 2. I know that the order with respect to P is now a 1, so X is a 1. I don't know why, that's what I'm going to try and find out. 1.25 times 10 to the minus 2, 2 2.5. 2.50 times 10 to the minus 2 to the power y, where well, y is with the order with respect to q, and I've got these two which happen to be the same, so that's going to be a 1. So 4 to the power 1 with this one 
equals 0.5 to the power y. Uh, these two numbers are the same, so it equals 1. Divide, uh, 4 to the power 1 is 4. Take this across the other side, so 1 divided by 4 uh, turns out to be 0 0.25. So 0 0.5 to the y equals 0 0.25. Is it a 0? No, because if y was a 0, then this number here would be a 1. Is it a 1? No, it's not, because 0 0.5 to the power 1 would be 0 0.5, and it's not. Therefore, y must be a 2. And you can check that. 0 0.5 squared is 0 0.25. So with respect to Q is a 2. Question 4.3. A reaction between substances R and S was second order with respect to R and second order with respect to S. So I can write that here as rate equals K R to the 2 S to the 2. The concentration of R raised to the power 2 S to the power 2 because the initial um, order with respect to R is a 2, second order, so that's a 2. Uh, order with respect to S is a 2, so that's a 2. Then what's it tell me? Um, it tells me the initial rate was 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3, so that's the rate equals K. I don't know that, that's what I've got to try and find out. It's given me the concentration of, the initial concentration of R was 1. 0 0.00 times 10 to the minus 2. I'll put that in. That needs squaring because there's a square here. And uh, 2.45 times 10 to the minus 2 was the concentration of S. Again, that needs raising to the power 2. It needs squaring because there's a 2 here. It's order with respect to 2. So I've just multiplied these out now. 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 is K. Multiplied by 6 times 10 to the minus 8 is this here. Divide both sides by 6 times 10 to the minus 8. K is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3. Divided by 6 times 10 to the minus 8. 2. 0 0.00 times 10 to the minus 4. Everything's to three significant figures, so I've put this value 2.00 times 10 to the minus 4. Now I need the units. So, uh, units. Rate. Rate is always measured in moles divided by decimeter cubed in seconds. Equals K. I don't know the units of K. That's what I'm going to try and find out. Um, a concentration is moles divided by decimeter cubed. So I've got moles divided by decimeter cubed multiplied by moles divided by decimeter cubed because it's squared. Multiplied by moles divided by decimeter cubed multiplied by moles divided by decimeter cubed because it's squared. So I've got four moles divided by four decimeter cubed. I'm going to cancel a mole and a mole on each side. I'm going to cancel a de divide by a decimeter cubed on each side. So now um, my units are one because that mole's disappeared. The decimeter cubes disappeared divided by s and i've got three moles on the right divided by three decimeter cubed um, i'm going to take the decimeter cube from the bottom on this side across to the top i'm going to take the three moles on the uh, top here down to the bottom so k is decimeter cubed uh, decimeter cubed decimeter cubed divided by mole 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 divided by s the s is still on the bottom so that's uh, add these three uh, three threes here to make a nine uh, mole uh, mole 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 is mole three but because it's on the bottom of i'm bringing it up into standard form onto the top it's mole to the minus three s is to the power one on the bottom it's a one but on the top in standard form it's s to the minus one Question 5. The exam board have ruled this question out. It's the exam board are saying it contains errors. It wasn't tested. It can't be solved. Question 6. 6.1. This question is about isomers. Give a reagent and observations for a test tube reaction to distinguish between 2 methyl butan 1 ol. So I've drawn this out here. Carbon 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's but. This one's got 4 as well. 1, 2, 3, 4. So they're both but, but, 2 methyl butan 1 ol. So the methyl groups on carbon number 2. There's carbon number 1, carbon number 2. That carbon's got an OH on carbon number 1, carbon number 1 with the OH. Carbon number 2 has got the methyl. 2 methyl butan 1 ol. This one has got 2 methyl butan 2, 2 ol. So the methyl group and the ol group are both at carbon number 2. And there they are. Carbon number 1, carbon number 2, carbon number 3, 4. The methyl group and the OH are both at carbon number 2. So this is a primary alcohol. The C with the OH has got one other carbon here bonded to it. The C with the OH has got 1, 2, 
three carbons bonded to it. So this is a tertiary alcohol, a primary alcohol and a tertiary alcohol. You can test for primary and secondary alcohols by using acidified potassium dichromate and that goes orange to green with primary and secondary alcohols. So two methyl butan one alt would go from orange to green and with the tertiary alcohol there's no change. Compounds A and B both have the molecular formula C4H8Br2. A has a singlet, a triplet and a quartet. It's hydrogen NMR spectrum. So A has three different hydrogen environments. It's got three peaks. Uh, hydrogens in different environments bonded to different sets of atoms. B only has two singlets in its uh, hydrogen uh, spectrum. So I suspect that you've probably got some kind of symmetry or some kind of groups that are bonded to the same carbon atom so that they're in the same environment, those hydrogens. We've got some kind of sym symmetry with a low number of peaks here. Um, only two singlets in its NMR, so that's got two singlets. So this one has got a singlet, a triplet and a quartet. So let's try and identify what a singlet is. A singlet means the H is bonded to a C. The H that we're talking about is bonded to a C, and that C that the H is bonded to is bonded to a carbon with no H's. Hmm, I'm thinking maybe there's two BRs on that. That would mean that there's no H's, and if it were in the middle of a chain, you'd have a carbon either side. That's what I'm thinking. Maybe two BRs and a carbon in the middle of a chain. So that carbon then would give a singlet um, because... Uh, there's no hydrogens on that. If it's in the middle of a chain, it's got carbon either side with two BRs. That would give a singlet. Um, it's got a triplet, so it's got a H on a C, and that C is bonded to a CH2. And it's got an H on a C bonded to a CH3. Maybe there's a CH2 and a CH3 together. So I'm thinking something like this. CH3 with a C with two BRs in the middle of a chain, I've got CH2 bonded to a CH3, CH3 bonded to CH2. So let's have a look. These hydrogens here bonded to a carbon. The neighbouring carbon has got no hydrogens, so those H's are going to have a singlet. Uh, CH2 uh, bonded to a carbon with no hydrogens to the left, but bonded to the right, there's a carbon with uh, three hydrogens, three uh, sound like four, so that's going to give a quartet. So these hydrogens in the CH2 are going to be split into a quartet. And the CH3, those hydrogens on the CH3, to the left and the carbon, there's two hydrogens. That's going to give a triplet. Yep, so that works out correct. A singlet, a triplet, and a quartet. Singlet, triplet from the CH3, and the CH2 will give a quartet. Okay, uh, now I need some kind of symmetry, something um, where there's a limited number of hydrogen environments. I'm thinking maybe there's two CH3s bonded to the same carbon. Two CH3s bonded to the same carbon would just give one peak. And if that carbon had a BR on it and was in the middle of a chain, then that would give a singlet. So I'm looking at two CH3s bonded to a CBR. Two CH3s bonded to a CBR. So here's my reason for thinking. I've got two CH3s bonded to the same carbon. So all those six hydrogens are in the same environment. That's going to limit the number of peaks, the number of hydrogen environments. And because they're bonded to a CBR, that C has got no H's. So these two are going to be singlets. And then the rest of it, I've just put together a CH2BR. And I look at these hydrogens, that's going to give a singlet as well. They're in a different environment because the CH2s, uh, the H's are bonded to C's and BR's. So it's going to give a second peak. But again, it's going to be a singlet because uh, the H's are bonded to a C and the neighbouring C has got no H's. So that's going to give a singlet. So those were, those were my two sets of reasons and my two answers. Compounds C and D both have the molecular formula um, C6H3Br3. Um, three hydrogens, six carbons, Br3. I'm thinking that maybe it's a cyclic compound. Um, yeah, six carbons, but only three hydrogens, so a cyclic compound. Three hydrogens, three Br's, 
That's six in total for the six carbons. Yeah, I've got six carbons in a ring and I've got three hydrogens and three BRs coming off that uh, benzene ring. Uh, two peaks in its uh, carbon 13. So I'm looking at carbon 13 now. So the carbons only have two environments uh, in, in compound C. In compound D, they have four peaks, four different carbon environments. Two peaks probably means it's going to be have some symmetry. So if I've got some kind of symmetry, I need the BRs to be spread around the ring to give two lines of symmetry, something like this one. So my carbons with BRs would give one peak, uh, and my carbons without BRs would give my second peak. And because I've got symmetry, the CBRs, 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 these three carbons are, I'll give one peak, and the other carbons without BRs will give the second peak two peaks. So I knew I had some kind of symmetry because I've got, only got two peaks. Now D has got four peaks, so it's not got very much symmetry at all. So I'm thinking maybe the BRs instead of spread um, equally around the ring, giving lots of lines of symmetry, maybe they're all together, something like this. Let's have a look. I've got a C with a BR. Let's say that's uh, that's one carbon environment here. I've got a C with a BR joined to a C with an H. So these two here are second peak. These two here with a C H bonded to a CBR are a third peak. And then this is a fourth peak with a CH bonded to two CHs either side. Compounds E, F and G are isomers. Well, you've got to know a little bit about this. If I see a broad peak like this at around about 3,400, I know that's an alcohol. If it's a sort of, um, if it's, what I mean by broad is that it's not got a sharp point to it. It's sort of rounded at the bottom. And 3,400, if you look up in your data book, you'll find that it's an OH. That's definitely an alcohol, uh, a rounded uh, peak there, uh, absorption at around about 3,400 is definitely an alcohol. Now I've got an alcohol here and an alcohol here, but this is really a carboxylic acid. This is an alcohol, so this first one is is G. So this one here in the middle is G. I know this one is my carboxylic acid here because a carboxylic acid gives an absorption peak at around about 3000 and this one hasn't got one. A carboxylic acid again has a broad peak. It's slightly lower at about 3000 rather than 3400 which is an alcohol. This is a carboxylic acid and it tends to form a sort of more pointed absorption around about 3000. So this is my carboxylic acid. This is my E. This is E, the carboxylic acid group. This is the alcohol G which means F. Uh, doesn't have an alcohol group, doesn't have a carboxylic acid group, and this peak here at around about 1,700 um, is my C double bond O, and they've all got C double bond O, they're all carbonyl compounds. Question number seven, isomers X and Y have the molecular formula C5H8O, give the name for isomer X. Well, let's have a look at it. It's got single bonds. It's got one, two, three, four, five. It's penta pentane, but it's cyclic. So it's cyclopentane with a ketone group, a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. So cyclopentane ohm, but I need to drop the E so I don't have an E and an O of the ohm together. Cyclopentane ohm. Explain how X and Y can be distinguished in terms of boiling points. Well, boiling points are due to the intermolecular bonds. The carbon to oxygen here is going to be a polar bond. So oxygen is more electronegative than the carbon. So the oxygen is going to have, it's also got lone pairs of electrons, it's going to have a slight delta minus, and the C has got a slight delta plus. And so those delta plus and delta minuses between the uh, different molecules will a bond will attract as an intermolecular bond. A carbon to an oxygen or a carbon to a Cl or a carbon to a Br, that forms dipole-dipole attractions. 
However, if I've got an oxygen to a hydrogen or a nitrogen bonded to a hydrogen or a fluorine bonded to a hydrogen, the difference in electronegativities between the oxygen and the hydrogen or the nitrogen and the hydrogen, fluorine and the hydrogen is very much larger. Um, so oxygen gets a very large delta minus and H gets a very large delta plus. And so the intermolecular bonds between these polar bonds in the molecule and the polar bonds in the neighboring molecule, this hydrogen bond here is much stronger. So this is gonna have a higher boiling point. So Y has the higher boiling point because Y has hydrogen bonds and X only has dipole, dipole, intermolecular bonds. And more energy is needed to overcome these hydrogen bonds. That's why it has a higher boiling point. Um, carbon-13 NMR. I've got one carbon environment here at the top where the CO is. Uh, these two are symmetrical. You've got a line of symmetry right down the middle, so this would give a second peak and this would, these two would give a third peak, these uh, in the same environment. Same for this. One carbon environment bonded to the C bonded to the OH. Uh, another carbon environment because these two are symmetrically opposite and a third carbon environment these two which are symmetrically opposite so they're both going to give three peaks however they'll have different shift patterns so the peaks will appear along the x-axis at different points so they've both got three peaks in their carbon nmr but it, then if we look in the data book a c double bond o to a c so there's a c double there's a c there and there's a c here a c double bond o to a c this carbon here look at the carbon that's um, bold this carbon bonded to a CO, so this one here or this one here, both given the same peak, remember, is going to have uh, a peak with a shift pattern of 20 to 50. Okay, This one doesn't have any Cs bonded to COs, but it has a C bonded to an O bonded to an H. So this C here and this C here are bonded, sorry, this C here at the top rather, this C here, which is bonded to an O, this C here at the top, is bonded to an O and it's an alcohol so that would give um, a peak between 50 and 90 so these two carbons here would give a peak with a shift um, number of um, 20 to 50 this carbon here bonded to an O uh, in an alcohol would give um, a peak with a shift value of 50 to 90 and then finally, the infrared spectra, I've got carbon to oxygen bond and I've got a carbon to OH bond here. So I've got a C double bond O and I've got a COH here. So if I look here, a C double bond O um, gives an absorption in the infrared spectrum of 1,608 to 1,750. Important you quote that, quote it from the data book, write it down from the data book and Y as an OH. Uh, which is going to give an absorption at 3,230 to 3,550. Again, write it down. Um, and you might as well say they're both going to have different fingerprint regions. That's the sort of messy region uh, below a wave number of 1,500 centimetres to the minus 1. So it's the right-hand side of the graph, and that messy value um, identifies the uh, the compound so if you're not exactly sure what it is you get a known sample of what you think it is you run it through uh, the infrared spectrometer and if it then gives the same fingerprint pattern uh, you know that you've got your sample and your unknown sample are the same so uh, your known sample and unknown must be the same if the fingerprint region below 1500 is the same Paracetamol is a medicine commonly used to relieve mild pain. It's a painkiller. Traditionally, paracetamol has been made industrially in a three-step synthesis from phenol. Phenol is a benzene ring with an OH and alcohol group on it. And here in step one that I need the mechanism for, it's, it's had an NO2, a nitro group, bonded to it. The way that you get um, groups bonded onto the ring is you have a look at the group and you make it plus charge. So that's been NO2 plus. And that gives a reason then for the ring to attack um, the, the plus charge on whatever species is then going to join onto the ring. So I need to make NO2 plus. 
So the way to make NO2+, plus, I know it doesn't ask it in the question here, but we might as well know, uh, nitric acid HNO3, sulfuric acid H2SO4, you need to remember that, and you're going to make NO2+. plus. That's easy to remember because you look at the group NO2 and you make it plus charge. The plus is actually on the N, uh, but you won't get it wrong by putting it anywhere around it, but it is actually on the N. Um, what else will I get made? Well, unsurprisingly, I'm going to get some waters. I've got some H's and some O's, so I'll make some water. And then what's left? Uh, I've got two H's on the right, I've got three on the left, so H and S on the left, not used yet, and S on the right. Uh, seven O's, one, two, three, I've got four O's in this, I've made a plus, so I need to make a minus. This is called a nitronium ion, an NO2 plus, by the way, water, and hydrogen sulfate. Now the mechanism looks like this, so electrons come from the ring and attack this plus charge on the N, the plus should really be on the N, and the N bonds to the carbon then. So this is an electrophile, electron pair acceptor, um, and it replaces the H that's on there. So remember, there's unseen H's on each of the carbons here. This is a skeletal formula, and there's unseen H's. So this is an electrophile, electron pair acceptor, replacing the H. So this is going to be electrophilic substitution. Uh, just to finish this off then, electrons given away from the ring, that's why it's a plus charge. We break the ring uh, temporarily and we draw a horseshoe. I prefer if that diagram there had a closer horseshoe, so the gap was a little bit tighter towards this carbon that's got the NO2. And the electrons go through the gap and into the ring then from the H. The H is then released as H+, plus because electrons have gone away from it, so it's broken off and it's a plus charge. And the plus charge then balances out, beginning and end. And the NO2 group then is uh, added to the ring uh, by, via electrophilic substitution. Complete the equation for this one. Well, I've, I've replaced O's with H's. So the easiest way of replacing O's with H's or adding H's to something is to add hydrogen. Add hydrogen. Here, unsurprisingly, the hydrogen replaces the oxygen, so I've added some extra hydrogens. I'm going to make some water, fairly obviously, and I'm going to balance it here. Two, two O's, two O's there, two waters, four H's, five, six H's. Everything else remains the same, six H's. Incidentally, you need a nickel catalyst here, and the mechanism type when you add hydrogen is called hydrogenation. So it's a hydrogenation mechanism. Uh, you don't need to know the exact mechanism for it, but it's called hydrogenation. And hydrogen, when you add hydrogen to anything, it's called hydrogenation. You need a nickel catalyst. And that's the easiest way to replace O's with H's, or just to add H's to something like CN's to make uh, amine groups primary amines. In theory, after ethanol chloride or ethanoic anhydride could be used in step one, complete the mechanism. So this is something called addition elimination. When you get an acyl chloride, that's a group with a C double bond OCl, then you get addition elimination, a special kind of mechanism. R can be any group you want. So I've got an NH2, um, an amine group um, with, with an R, which can be anything. Um, so it attacks the lone pair of electrons on the N, attacks the C, and the double bond breaks and goes on to the O. The next stage is that the NH2R, the NH2R bonds to that C. So I've got a, now a bond where the N has used its pair of electrons to bond to the C. The electrons of, from the double bond have gone on to the O, so now it's got a single bond. I've drawn the pair of electrons there from the bond on the O, and it's minus because it's had an electron and an arrow go towards it. Um, now, in the next step, next part of the, the mechanism, you need three arrows. The CL is, is broken off at this point. Electrons go from the bond onto the CL. The CL is electronegative anyway, so withdrawing electrons towards itself. So no surprise, the electrons break from the bond and go into the CL. The lone pair of electrons, remember an arrow, can only come from a lone pair or a single bond, double bond or a ring. There's only four places it can come from. It can't come from that minus. If you draw an arrow from that minus, you'll get it wrong. It's coming from the lone pair and reforming this double bond. So in addition elimination, the double bond breaks but then reforms in the next step. And I've got to get rid of this plus charge on the N. Remember the N has got a plus charge because it's had electrons go away from it. So the minus 
this is formed here, I need a plus charge at the same time, and the plus charge is on the N. That N has got too many bonds, it, only, it can only have three bonds. So I'm going to break an H off and move the electrons onto the N. The electrons are minuses, so that will get rid of that plus on the N and break the H off as an H plus. So I'm going to get um, this formed. C double bond O, CH3, C double bond O, the CL has gone. The N has now become NH because one of the H's is broken off and there's the R group still on there and the plus charge and the minus charge have disappeared because electrons have gone away from the O, that's removed the minus and electrons have gone onto the N, that's removed the plus. I'll also get H plus and CL minus, I'll get HCL formed as white steamy fumes. In practice, ethanoic anhydride is used in industrial system synthesis rather than ethanol chloride. Give two reasons why ethanol chloride is not used in the industrial synthesis. Well, in the Mark scheme, they only allow two things. It's corrosive and dangerous. The ethanol chloride is corrosive and dangerous. I've said it's dangerous. It gives off white steamy fumes of hydrogen chloride gas, which dissolves in your lung. The lungs makes hydrogen hydrochloric acid in water or in moist tissues such as your lung, so, and will dissolve your lungs. A very very toxic gas. Um, however, not in the Mark scheme. But the real reason, incidentally, that they don't use it in industrial synthesis is because ethanoic anhydride is more expensive. Oh, sorry, it's less expensive than ethanol chloride. So ethanol chloride, corrosive and dangerous, uh, burns the skin. Dangerous, makes hydrogen chloride white steamy fumes, which are toxic. Um, and also um, ethanol chloride is more expensive than ethanol anhydride. And that's one of the main reasons they actually use it in industrial synthesis to try and save some money. In step three, other aromatic uh, products are formed as well as paracetamol. I'll draw the structure of one of these other aromatic products. So let's go back and have a look at step three. Um, step three. So the ethanol chloride is bonding to that N. Uh, so the lone pair of electrons on the N is bonding to the COCl, the C of the COCl in additional elimination reaction. However, there's a lone pair of electrons on that oxygen as well, so there's no reason why the oxygen couldn't bond to the COCl group, and this could form an ester. I'll show you what I mean here. So there's a lone pair of electrons on the O, and this is my ethanol chloride, so the lone pair of electrons can bond to that C and it will release, release HCl. So I get HCl replaced, uh, released here in a condensation reaction. Remember, a condensation reaction is where small molecules such as water or HCl are formed. So a condensation reaction is not just making water, it can make small other gaseous molecules, other small gaseous molecules like HCl, and then therefore I'm going to get an ester formed here when HCl is released. So the O uh, lone pair of electrons will attack that C um, and then you get additional elimination mechanism and it forms this chemical here. Um, tricky one here in the second step of this reaction hydroquinone this one reacts with ammonium ethanoate to form paracetamol. Complete the equation for the second step. The first thing is the ammonium. Ammonium is NH4. Eth is two carbons. Ethanoate is an ester. So I've got CH3, CH2, CH3, C double bond O rather, um, O. So CH3, CO, and then an NH4. That's ammonium ethanoate. That's the hard bit of this question. CH3, CO, two carbons, eth. O8 is an ester, C double bond O, O, and NH4 is ammonium. Um, and then all I've got to then do is, I think it's fairly obvious what's going to be formed here. I seem to have lost it. Um, some H's and some O's. I've got too many H's and O's in here. I've not got enough here. So it looks as if I've got to release some H's and some O's because the H's and O's have disappeared. I'm going to make some water and you can balance it by counting up the H's and O's uh, and you need two H2O. Uh, tricky question that, but once you've got the um, ammonium methanoate and you've worked out there's probably water form because there's O's and H's that are, are accounted for that are on the left and not on the right, you can balance it and make some water, but difficult that one. 8.7. Calculate the mass in kilograms of hydroquinone, MR110, need to produce 250 kilograms of paracetamol. Well, first of all, um, 
I need to find out what paracetamol is in hydroquinone and work out the MR of paracetamol. So I've got paracetamol here and I can add up the MR of that with 1, 2, 3, 4, 6 carbons in the ring, that's 12, 4 hydrogens on the ring that are unseen, an oxygen which is a 16, a hydrogen on the OH, um, an N is a 14, a 1, a 12, a 16, a 12 and 3 ones and it will come out at 151. So now I've got 250 grams of uh, kilograms of paracetamol. Now I've s skipped a step here. I could turn kilograms into grams by multiplying it by a thousand, but then when I get my uh, amount of hydroquinone in grams, I'm going to have to take it back to kilograms by uh, dividing by a thousand so I can convert my kilograms into grams and then when I get my answer in grams convert it back to kilograms so I can just leave it as it is actually so I'm going to choose to leave it as it is um, so moles of paracetamol uh, uh, moles is mass uh, divided by MR actually no here yeah, I've multiplied it by a thousand to get it into into moles uh, I could have avoided the thousand bit but I have done that sorry uh, 250 divided by a thousand so I've converted my 250 kilograms into grams by multiplying by a thousand divided by the MR and worked out the moles of paracetamol 1655.6 moles that equals the number of moles of hydroquinone used because one mole of hydroquinone makes one mole of paracetamol. So I've got the same number of moles of hydroquinone used and then moles is mass divided by MR. I've got the MR of hydroquinone. Multiply the number of moles, which is 1655.6, multiply by 110, 182119 grams. And then to get grams up into a higher unit value, you divide by 1000 at 182. Um, probably safer to convert into grams and kilograms because you'll get some marks for the working out if you make a mistake at a later stage. Uh, everything is 250 kilograms is in uh, to three significant figures. So I've left that to three significant figures here. This is to four significant figures, but you always take the lower number of significant figures in the data in the question. So that's the, the three significant figures, four significant figures, three significant figures is the lower number of so significant figures. So I'll take that for my answer into three significant figures. Question nine. This question is about thin layer chromatography. So I've taken a protein, I've hydrolyzed it. That's a reaction with uh, with water using an acid catalyst. Create some amino acids, put on a thin layer chromatography plate and separated them. Separated the amino acids. Suggest a suitable reagent for the hydrolysis of a protein. So hydrolysis is a reaction with water and you're breaking the peptide bonds. Um, to break the protein up into amino acids, but it needs an acid catalyst. And so if you add an acid, if it's more concentrated, then it's going to hydrolyze the protein better. Concentrated hydrochloric acid is probably the most successful acid to use along with some water. Concentrated hydrochloric acid. Suggest how the positions of the amino acids on the TLC plate were located. Well, you have to either use an anhydrin spray or ultraviolet light to, um, to be able to identify the spots of amino acids to get them to show up on the plate. Deduce the number of, uh, minimum number of amino acids present in the original mixture. Well, we look here. So this one here didn't actually rise up the plate at all because when we've turned it around, it's produced two spots there. So this one has made gone up into one, two, three, and part of it stayed there, so it separates into one, two, three, four. But then we've turned when we've turned it round again, we've identified one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's risen up here as well. So this one that didn't move up at all has now separated into two. This one has separated into two, this one separated into two, and this one separated into one. So we've got seven different spots. Suggest why it's necessary to use two different solvents because the first solvent didn't separate all of the amino acids. So some of the amino acids did not separate with the first solvent.
Question 10. Some compounds with different molecular formula have the same relative molecular mass to the nearest whole number. A dicarboxylic acid has a relative molecular mass of 118 to the nearest whole number. Deduce the molecular formula of the acid. So if it's got 118, then I know that uh, a carboxylic acid has got C double bond OOH. And if it's a dicarboxylic acid, it's got two C double bond OOHs. So all I then do is work out what the remainder must be. So if a dicarboxylic acid has got C double bond OH twice, um, then that's uh, a 12, two 16s under one, and I've got two of those. So the two, carbo the two carboxylic acid groups, the two COOH groups, come to 90. So the remaining bit is 28. So I can work out the remaining bit must have uh, C2H4 in the middle of it. So it's got C double bond OOH, it's got CH2, CH2, C double bond, OOH. It's got two carboxylic acid groups and it's got four carbons in total. So its molecular formula is C4H6O4. A student dissolved some of the dicarboxylic acid in water and made a solution up to 250 centimetre cubed in a volumetric flask. In a titration, 25 centimetre cubed of the sample, I've got to remember I've got a tenth of the sample, so whatever calculation I do here, I need to multiply by up by 10 for my original at the end. I've got to remember that when I get a sample, I've got a tenth sample, multiply back by 10 at the end of my calculation. Is needed, uh, needed 21.5 centimetres cubed of 0 0.109 mole per decimeter cubed sodium hydroxide solution for neutralization. So I've got a volume and a concentration of sodium hydroxide. So to get one mark uh, to start with, I'm going to do uh, number of moles, concentration equals number of moles divided by volume in decimeter cubed. I'll convert this into decimeter cubed, centimeter cubed up into decimeter cubed, up into a high unit value, divide by 1000. So that's 0 0.0215 decimeter cubed. Concentration is 0 0.109. So 0 0.109 equals um, number of moles divided by 0 0.0216. Multiply the 0 0.109 by 0 0.0216 and I'll get the number of moles. So moles 21.6 divided by 1000 to get the decimeter cube multiplied by the concentration 0 0.109. 0, uh, so 2.3544 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. That's the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. Now the dicarboxylic acid, the carboxylic acid group reacts with um, the sodium hydroxide, but there's two acid groups on there. So two acids, it's almost like a, a double strength acid. It's got two acids. So one acid will take two sodium hydroxides. So it's a diprotic acid. It means it's got two acid groups on there. So one mole of the dicarboxylic acid will react with two moles of the sodium hydroxide because it's got two acid groups to react with the sodium hydroxide. So it uses up two moles of sodium hydroxide for every one mole of dicarboxylic acid. So I need to divide by two to work out the number of moles of acid. Divide the number of moles of acid uh, by two. One point divide the number of moles of sodium hydroxide by 2, I'll get the number of moles of the diprotic acid, the dicarboxylic acid, 1.177 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. Um, now that's in, in 25 centimetre cubed, so I need to multiply by 10 to work out what it was in um, not just in the one tenth sample, but in the original. Multiply by 10, 1.177 uh, times 10 to the uh, minus 2 now. Um, moles equals uh, mass divided by uh, mass multiplied by MR. So I'll multiply by the MR and it comes out as 1.39 grams. I've put it to three significant figures because um, some of the other data in the questions is to three significant figures. Three significant figures, three significant figures, three significant figures, four significant figures, but some of them are to th only three significant figures. So that's going to be three significant figures. Compounds with the um, molecular formula also have a relative molecular mass of 118 to the nearest whole numbers. These include the, the, the diol shown below. Deduce the number of peaks in the hydrogen NMR spectrum of this diol. So I've got one in this CH3 here, one, 
2, the OH is different, that H is different again, that's 3, and the H's in the CH2 are different again. So I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, but it's completely symmetrical, so it's 4. So these two CH3's are 1, the two OH's, the H's in the two OH's are 2, two H's at the top are 3, and the two CH2's are 4. Because it's completely symmetrical, it's going to give 4 peaks. Draw the structure of a different dial with the same molecular formula uh, that has a hydrogen spectrum that contains two singlet peaks. Two, only two peaks, singlets. Um, so only two peaks means it's going to be fairly symmetrical. It's going to be a symmetrical structure with just two peaks. I'm looking for some kind of symmetry. And two singlet peaks means that the hydrogens are bonded to C's without any um without any hydrogens bonded to it so i'm going to ha have to have a sym sym symmetrical um structure it's going to have to be symmetrical uh, look it's got a line of symmetry down the the middle so i've moved the two ohs to the middle and created ch3s around the outside so that's a peak that's a CH3 bonded to the same carbon, line of symmetry. All those CH3s will give one single peak. Uh, the OHs, the Hs on the Os are, are both the same. That'll give a second peak. And they're bonded to Cs that have got four, uh, no hydrogens bonded to them as well. So one singlet from the CH3s, one singlet from the OHs. So symmetry, and you knew that the um, the CH3s and the OHs needed to be bonded to carbons with no hydrogens. A dicarboxylic acid in 10.1 and the isomers um, in questions 10.3 all have a relative molecular mass of 118. State where the dicarboxylic acid can be distinguished from the two dials by high resolution mass spectrometry using electrospray ionization. So what actually happens is um, because it's high resolution mass spectrometry, if it's high resolution, it will go sometimes to five decimal places. So even though the MRs are 118, it will go to a very, very precise level. The precise masses are different. So high resolution mass spectrometry will go to something like five decimal places. So even though it's 118, it will go to five decimal places and it will be able to identify um, uh, the, 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 or distinguish between the two uh, dials because it's high resolution. Uh, precise masses are different. Question 11. This question is about esters including biodiesel which are long chain esters. An ester is formed by the reaction of an acid anhydride. Here's an acid anhydride. This is called propanoic anhydride. Normally, they ask about ethanoic anhydride, which has got one C and a methyl group CH3. So C, CH3, C, CH3 here. But they made the chain slightly longer to be three carbons long. So this is propanoic anhydride rather than ethanoic anhydride. But the reactions are still the same. You react it with an alcohol and it breaks here. And when it breaks here, if you have a look at it, um, then this part here, this CH3, CH2, CO, gets the part that's not ringed here. It bonds to the O, CH2, CH3. So it forms CH3, CH2, CO, O, CH2, CH3, and that's the ester. This part at the bottom here, CH3, CH2, CO, O, gets that ringed H and forms a carboxylic acid. Now normally if it was ethanoic anhydride it would form ethanoic acid but this time it's going to form one two three carbons CO O and that ringed H it's going to form propanoic acid. So this is what it forms. So here you can see again CH3 CH2 CO has got this there it is CH3 CH2 CO has now where it's broken off here that C has got the OCH2 CH3, OCH2 CH3. And this bottom half, the CH3 CH3 CH2 COOH, it's got a carboxylic acid group that's propanoic acid. What's the name of this ester then? Will you name esters from the right hand side? That's an ethyl here, CH2 CH3, and then one, two, three, three carbons is prop 
and an ester, that's something with a COOO in the middle of the chain, ends in O8. So it's ethyl propanoate. In a reaction to form biodies, one molecule of a vegetable oil reacts with an excess of methanol to form two moles of an ester with a molecular formula C19H34O2 and one mole of an ester with a molecular formula c 19 See H36O2. Draw the structure of the vegetable, showing clearly the ester links. Okay, so this is what you've got to do. You've got to know about the structure of a vegetable oil. A vegetable oil always has the same structure. It has CCC and then it has three branches. Okay, so CH2, CH, CH3, so the carbon has four bonds. Um, and then it has three branches. Each of these are esters. So they all have OCO, OCO, OCO. So this portion of the molecule is always the same. But these carbon chains, these hydrocarbon chains of carbon and hydrogen, can vary in length. And you'll see why I've chosen C17H31, C17H31, C17H33. They could be different. So there could be different numbers of carbons and different numbers of hydrogens. But in this case, the question gives you a clue as to what they are. When you're at it with methanol, and you need three moles of methanol, and you'll see why in a minute, it breaks it along here. This is where it breaks it in between the CO, CO, CO. And the OHs, and there are three methanols, so three lots of OH, join on one, two, three. And you get a trial. Okay, three OHs. So that breaks there and the three OHs go one, two, three. And the three CH3s join at the other end here. CH3, CH3, CH3. And now I get a long chain ester. This is my biodiesel. So it's diesel that can be put into cars and vehicles formed from vegetable oil, from vegetables. It's a way of powering cars from a renewable energy uh, source, vegetable oil. Now, why have I chosen C17H31, C17H31, C17H33? When you have a look here, then there's a CH3 that's joined, that's one carbon. There's a carbon in the um, ester group, in the CO, so that's one, two, and then there's the remainder. Okay, it says here it makes an ester with a molecule of C19H34O2. Um, two moles of that so it's got two moles of C19H34O2 and one of C19H36O2 so what I do is I work out this portion by subtraction I know that the CH3O CH3 and then the remainder so if I say C19 well two carbons are in this portion so that C19, C19 becomes, this part is C17. So 17, add 1, add 1, gets to the 19. H34, well, there's three H's in here, 34 in total. 31, add 3, is 34. And two O's, which are always there. So I know that this portion is C17H31. It says it makes two moles of this, two identical. So I've got another one identical underneath. So I've got another C17H31 here. So that's C17H31 and C17H31. Because that means that that's C19H34O2 in total. Now this last one, it says a mole of an ester with a molecular form is C19H36O2. So I've got two carbons in this portion of the chain, C19, so the rest must be C17 again. H36, well I've got three here, so in here there must be 33, because three, 33 add 3 is 36, O2, and that's where it comes from. So I take these values here, these molecular formula of the esters that are made, and I take from here, subtract two carbons, two oxygens and three hydrogens and I find out what the remainder is. The compound C19H34O2 is the methyl ester of ZZ octadeca 912 dienoic acid. Part of the structure is shown below. So let's have a look at it. Let's not be frightened by this. It's got 
To complete the skeletal formula, show the next part of the hydrocarbon chain up to carbon number 14. In your answer, show the Z stereo, uh, stereo chemistry around both carbon to carbon double bonds. So this is my oic acid. This is my carboxylic acid. And this is carbon number one. Let's just check that out. Carbon number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, carbon number eight. So this one here will be nine, then there'll be 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, it eventually got up to 19, but only asked me to draw up to 14. So I'm going to have to draw the rest of the chain up to 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, to get up to carbon number 14. Um, now, um, the diene oic acid, well there's my oic acid, diene, -ene, the E has been dropped from there, E, N, and there should be an E in there, but it's been dropped because you don't have two vowels together. That means diene, I've got two double bonds, one at carbon number 9 and one at carbon number 12. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Carbon number 9 has got a double bond. Then it'll go 10, 11, 12. 12 will have a double bond, then there'll be 13 and 14. I've got to make sure that the ZZ, so there's 8, there's 9 with the double bond, 10, 11, 12 with the double bond, 13, 14. And I've put the double bonds in here. Are the ZZ, that's a carbon there. There's a hydrogen off it. Hydrogen has got atomic number 1. The other carbon here, carbon 8, has got an atomic number of 6. So that will take priority. On the right hand side there's a hydrogen coming off here and a carbon coming down. Carbon has an atomic number 6, hydrogen only has atomic number 1. That has priority. So that's Z with both groups taking priority, both carbons on the same side, Z. And 12, again the carbons coming down this way and the carbons coming down this way. So these two will take priority, that's Z as well. Question 11.4. Give an equation for the complete combustion of C19H34O2. So combustion is a reaction with oxygen. Complete combustion means it's going to make carbon dioxide and water. Incomplete combustion would make carbon monoxide, CO and water, or possibly some carbon. C19H34O2 plus some O2 makes CO2 and water. Um, I'd start off by balancing the carbons. The carbons, 19 carbons, the only place where carbons go are in the CO2, so there's 19 of those. Um, I know I'm making waters, there's 34 H's, so that's got to be 17, because 2 times 17 is 34, and then I can balance the oxygens here, last of all. Let's add it up. 19 times 2 is 38. Add seven, uh, so add 38 for those in there. Add 17. 48, 55, take away 2 is 53, so 26 and a half times 2 equals 53. Combustion of a biodiesel produces greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide that causes global warming. Part of the infrared spectrum of the carbon dioxide is shown below. State how the infrared spectrum of carbon dioxide in figure 3 is not what, you, what might you expect from the data provided in table A of the data booklet. Well here, that you'd expect carbon dioxide would be a carbon with a double bond O and another double bond O, CO2 with two carbon to oxygen double bonds, so the carbon has four bonds. Yet this doesn't correspond with the C double bond O value. So the absorption at 2350, which is here, does not correspond, doesn't match the data book value of 1680 to 1750 for an expected carbon to oxygen bond. Okay, so this value here doesn't match up with the carbon to oxygen double bond. So something strange is going on with the infrared spectrum of carbon dioxide here. You don't need to know what it is, you just need to identify that this isn't the absorption value for a carbon to oxygen double bond. It should be at 1680 to 1750 instead of at 2350. Explain how carbon dioxide causes global warming. Well, what actually happens is the, the bonds either vibrate or stretch, and when the bonds vibrate or stretch, they absorb infrared radiation, and the infrared radiation therefore gets 
trapped. It doesn't escape from the atmosphere. It gets trapped in the carbon dioxide as the carbon dioxide bonds, the C double bond O uh, bonds, stretch and vibrate um, and hold on to the heat, keep the heat, keep uh, the heat within the atmosphere rather than it being um, reflected back out of the atmosphere. Question 12. This is about DNA and I've got two uh, DNA strands with complementary bases here. Draw all the hydrogen bonds between the complementary strands shown in figure 4. Use dashed lines to show the hydrogen bonds. Well, I've taken a section here from the data book and what you should do is you should draw lone pairs on every single O and lone pairs on every single N and then any NH's you should make as polar bonds with a delta plus on the H and a delta minus on the N and then the lone pairs from this O will bond to the delta plus of that N and then you go around clockwise the delta plus here on the H will bond round to the lone pair on the N here and then the lone pair on the O will bond to the delta plus on that H. So lone pairs on O's and N's bond to delta pluses on the H and you'll form three hydrogen bonds then between guanine and cytosine and then the same for thymine. Lone pairs on single O's will bond to the delta plus on, N, on H's of NH2's and then similarly NH here, the delta plus on the H will bond to the lone pair on the N. And then you can match up here, you can check what's what. Two N's with a double bond O, two N's with a double bond O. This bond here, bonding to the two deoxyribose, by the way, is this blue one coming down from the NH. So I've got a blue one going to an N, double bond O, NH. I've got thymine here. So I've got NH, double bond O, NH. This one's thymine, and this one, therefore, that must be bonding to it is adenine. Um, and here I've got uh, an NH bonding to an N double bond O with an NH2. NH, NHO, NH2. This one here is cytosine and therefore it must be bonding to guanine. And I can identify where these bonds are going to. Um, I think I can probably uh, guess here that I've got one, two, three there between guanine and cytosine here. So I'm going to draw lone pairs on the O's, lone pairs on the single N's and on the single O's and delta pluses on the H's of the NH's and then put dotted lines between them and similarly here lone pairs should be on the N uh, delta pluses on the H's um, of the NH's and put dotted lines for the intermolecular hydrogen bonds. Draw a ring round each of the component parts make up the cytosine nucleotide well, we decided that this one was cytosine. Let's just check again. Cytosine with an NH bonding to the two deoxyribose and then double bond O, N, NH2, double bond O, N, NH2. Yes, this one's cytosine. So parts of a, a nucleotide are the base itself, the two deoxyribose and the phosphate. So the base the 2-deoxyribose and the phosphate make up a nucleotide, uh, a section of the DNA strand. State the meaning of the term complementary when it's used to refer to DNA strands. It basically means that the two bases are complementary. Adenine bonds to thymine and cytosine bonds to guanine. Question 13. Aqueous NaBH4, that's sodium borohydride, reduces aldehydes but does not reduce alkenes. Uh, show the first step of the mechanism of the reaction between sodium borohydride and 2-methylbutanal. So that's an aldehyde. Um, sodium borohydride uh, makes H- ions and the H- has got a lone pair of electrons that attacks the carbon of the carbon to oxygen double bond. So the first step of the reaction 
is where the hydride ion, so that's a H minus ion from sodium borohydride. Don't try and draw NaBH4 in a mechanism. It makes hydride ions, H minuses with a lone pair of electrons, and it attacks that C plus, C delta plus there. This is a, a polar bond here with a delta plus on the C and a delta minus on the oxygen. And it attacks that um, and it only wants the first step. Uh, the second step would be that that would make CO with a minus and a lone pair of electrons. And you add a little bit of acid to the mixture and it makes OH. So this will eventually make an OH CH2. Um, why does it not uh, react with 2-methylbutuanine, that's because it's got a carbon to carbon double bond that's got lots of electrons, we say it's electron rich, and so these hydride ions repel. So whereas now it's attacking a C delta plus, uh, a little delta plus on the polar carbon to oxygen double bond, it won't uh, attack an electron rich, that's a, a carbon to carbon double bond that's got lots of electrons because the H minus ion is repelled by that. A student attempted to reduce a sample of 2-methylbutanol but added insufficient sodium borohydride. So they wanted to test that it was incomplete with a chemical test. In other words, that there was some of the aldehyde left over. The reagent is um, Tollens reagent. It needs to be warm, so warm Tollens reagent and it will give a silver mirror. The other option is that you add failing solution. It gives a brick red precipitate.